Hello and welcome to this week's Cardinal Cast. Our conversation this week is going to be on school safety. So you'll notice uh, joining us today, we do not have the school counselor of the year, Lonnie Watson. Uh, she's off uh, at another, we should just say she's out doing her autograph tour. Yes. Um, but she's at another conference out of state right now. So joining me um, for the alumni, for people in Shadron, you're going to know this guy. Um, um, I'm excited to bring him in today so he can share on this topic. This is Mr. Craig Nobling, longtime colleague of, of mine here um, at Shadron Public Schools. So welcome, Craig. Thank you very much, Jerry. I appreciate that. So, Craig, on this, this topic, when we talk about school safety, but you and I don't like to mince words on this. We, we, we're going to talk about school attackers. Yes. Um, and this is going to apply for the people listening. This topic is important, number one, that we can talk about it so we can do some, you know, talk a little prevention yep. um, and then response. I, I think we spent a lot of time on the response part, and I think our school has done a very nice job, and the kids have done a very nice job of, of taking this seriously. But we spent a lot of time on the response part, barricading and that sort of thing. How many of these trainings on school safety and school attackers do you think we've done? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the actual number I don't know, Jerry. I, I, we've been from Omaha, and we have not been to Wyoming and South Dakota yet, but I think that could be in our, in our future. Yeah, we've, uh, actually, we've been approached by South Dakota. Yeah. Um, we just haven't gone out there yet, but uh, we've offered this training on this topic to schools um, for free uh, for a few years now. Yep. We've been all over the panhandle um, together and separate. Yep. We've presented at conferences in Kearney and Omaha as well. So um, I think schools are doing a better job of taking this seriously. When we started with this topic, one of the concerns was it just wasn't taken seriously. No, and, and, and from that, when you mentioned that, now we see all these uh, workshops and presentations by these, uh, these folks that, uh, that travel around and, and, and present. We're kind of ahead of the game. We're three, yeah. four plus years ahead of the game. So what they're, they're putting out right now, it's kind of old hat for us. We've kind of right. been doing this for a while. Um, we do have a why. Um, and this is something just as a friend of Craig's for a lot of years that I, I feel like we can't skip this part. Um, is why we, we mentioned it. it's an important part of the why. Part of the why is that we know of the first recorded school shooting in Nebraska happened here. Yeah, it, it, it happened. Yeah, 1995, February. Uh, one of our colleagues was yeah. was uh, was shot, and um, it, at that point, this was all new. This never happened before. It was pre Columbine, and I'm no way comparing this to Columbine. Right. It's just not. But um, nonetheless, it was a school shooting. Um, and the, the good part was is, is we never had a fatality, um, but we, it is school violence, and it was a precursor to, to Columbine. Uh, and part of our trainings, you know, I, when I introduced Craig, and, and the community here is going to know, know this story, but Craig Nobling was, the, was in that building that day, and Craig Nobling was the one, this guy right next to me was the one that took the gun out of the kid's hand in that hallway. Um, and, and I've, you know, I've appreciated that you've slowly shared more over the years, but it, yeah. it just took a while to kind of, to, to kind of pull some of that out. And then what we found is there's a lot of lessons. Some of the things that we've learned now, you've shared with me privately how, well, here's what happened then, you know, with media as right. an example, like yeah. how quick national media is going to show up on the scene. Yeah. The, the World Herald was here within within hours. I mean, they had somebody from North Platte, I believe, come up and kind of a, an independent writer, but affiliated with the Omaha World Herald, but it was all new. Um, there was, there were no, there was no protocol for this totally brand new. So it's been, it's just been interesting over the years that we've been doing this training that, you know, we, we get to communicate about that day. I wasn't in the district. I wasn't working for Shadron public schools at that time. Um, but we get to communicate and visit about lessons learned and we, we get to go relive that and, and man, here's where we need to improve some things. So, that, that's an important part of the why is as far as, you know, why do we do these presentations? Why does Shadron Public Schools take this so seriously? Right. Why are you and I constantly being pushed out yep. uh, to other schools? Is, is to, this stuff really happens. It yeah. happens anywhere. I, I don't think this is a, it necessarily Shadron Public Schools legacy. It's part of our history. It happened. And we have I think we've done a good job of moving forward. Uh, but it, it's still 
the story needs to be told um, it, because that's an as example. It happened to us. But um, now what are we doing to prevent it from happening not only here but other places as well? Right. Um, and, and we talk about we, we use a lot of data and research, which, by the way, on this podcast, probably not going to whip a lot of that out. Um, yeah. Maybe in the show notes, I'll add a few of the resources we use. Um, another re- another why that we take this seriously is is schools. Um, schools have this responsibility for kids, right? Um, and schools have been a target. Yep, absolutely. I mean, in the absence of the parent, um, it, it's called in loco parentis. Um, we are we're in charge of where we advocate for we protect um, besides educate and uh, we have to make sure that that we are uh, preventing and, and any violence but but at the same time educating uh, we, we just need to take care of those kids it's our duty to protect the kids and there's, there's there's lots of policies out there but we have to implement those as well and when we present to administrators um, sometimes it's a different cell there and I know it sounds bad but the duty to protect is what we spend our time on. We talk about, you know, the the most uh, a horrible reason to do this to take school safety seriously is to avoid lawsuits. Right. But we talk about that with administrators when we present that 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 is one piece where, you know, there's a legal requirement. Yes. That your your standard of care. Yep. And you're practicing these drills. That's right. You have the policies. That's exactly right. I I mean. We're a very litigious society. Right. We like to sue. I mean, that's just, it's the culture. Um, and there, there are lawsuits still um, out there on, and regarding Columbine. Uh, Dr. Angelis is, is, is still, I think, um, dealing with some of that. And, and certainly Sandy Hook, mm-hmm. um, even though that school has been, it, it's not even no longer a school, it's been bulldozed. Uh, the lawsuits are still there and they're still active. We've been fortunate enough to, to be at trainings. Um, some grant money has come in to, to send us out of state, even to some mm-hmm. national trainings. Um, we've had an opportunity to listen to um, Dr. De- DeAngelis out of yep. Columbine, um, parents at Sandy Hook, Christine Anderson, Christine Anderson, Virginia Tech. Tech. She was she was outstanding. She, yeah. her, her story, her um, how she has moved on, and but still, I mean, she's part of that legacy of, of being a survivor. Yeah, and these people that are telling their stories, John Michael Keyes is yes. another one comes to mind uh, yep. with the, the standard response protocol and the yep. changes that, that created. So, um, And we're really proud. We were doing these presentations, by the way, before Nebraska came out. So yep. the Department of Education then came out with yep. safety and security standards, and they broke it into four categories, right. correct? Yes, correct. I mean, the, the safety and security standards, we're not going to go into a lot of detail right. about those today, too. I mean, there's um, that's that's legal, legal mumbo-jumbo. And I think there's there's some terms we should probably discuss, but I don't think we're going to break those down here today. I mean, there's prevention and preparedness, um, response and recovery. Uh, we're still working on our reunification. I think we've stepped, we're way ahead of the game as a district. Our crisis team has done a good job with that, but we are still in that phase of, of trying to polish things. And I think this is going to be never ending. I think we're going to be doing this every year and we're going to be kind of reshaping things every single year another you know so the the parent student reunification if if there has to be a mass evacuation from a building mm-hmm. um how how do you know as administrators as, as school personnel how do we hand off students back to their parents who have you know we put them on buses we have a plan in place like, is, yeah. is what you're saying yeah. um uh, we call it our parent student reunification plan i've had other schools in the panhandle ask for our plan we give it to them yeah there's free resources with uh uh, I love you guys foundation that we use to kind of to build our plan, but we have those plans in place. Um, yeah. And I, so I think that's kind of where we're at. The other thing I'm kind of proud of is Nebraska added recovery. Uh, was that fourth one you yep. mentioned? Yep. And we have talked as a um, safety team in our district. Um, we have thoughts ahead of time on when we get into recovery, if something should happen. I hope not, but yes, absolutely. Hope not. <laughs> One thing I've noticed is like people want to help, but they don't know how to help. And right. so one school talked about they were just overloaded with teddy bears. Somebody got on the media and said, hey, you know, these kids, you know, send them in. The school just got like 
You had warehouses of teddy bears right. sent to them that they had to store. We had another one with bicycles. Well, you, well, with your experience in firefighting, you, you talked about that, your comparison with you come into a community and there are people always wanting to help but not sure what to do. Bottled water, chapstick. Cookies. Yeah, f I mean food. So I people care and they want to help, but I think we need to get um, our recovery piece, maybe a, a list or a guideline of what could the community do, what could you provide, but we don't, I mean, I, I don't know if you do it, this is for a shooting, this right. is for a fire, right. those sorts of things. And, and, and so our discussion is just to share this publicly is, is um, we plan to get ahead of it if we have you know, some event that's going to draw attention and, and people are going to want to you know, they want to show they care. So we, we know ahead of time we're going to set up uh, financial accounts and account at our local banks, and it's all going to be we're just taking donations, and those donations are going to be used for recovery. And I know Christina Anderson was one that gave yeah. us that idea uh, after the Virginia Tech shooting that um, the counseling services that are needed for long-term trauma, that stuff is there. And I mean, yeah. some people have insurance and there's other needs, but so our plans is – we want to have an account. We're going to take donations, and the yeah. donations are going to be used for recovery for the students right. and staff involved um, so that we can get counseling services, trauma counseling provided for years if needed. Um, so we kind of had those plans in place. And so, there, I mean, there's, there's going to be individual debriefing, mm -hmm. um, and eventually there will be group debriefing, people right. that were directly involved. And, and I think with our, our shooting that happened here, it was uncomfortable at first because, again, this was all new, you know, you don't, I don't need that. I'm fine. I'm good. Um, but almost in every incident, there's going to be some sort of post-traumatic stress, not a disorder, but um, that's, that's kind of a term that's being thrown out there quite a bit here lately. And um, I think people need to know the difference between the other, one or the other, post-traumatic stress versus it being a disorder. So, so now I'm going to turn this conversation a little bit back to um, school attacker and we'll talk a little bit, we can talk a little bit about our prevention, uh, what we have in place, what we do. Um, but I'm hoping we can spend our time on the response piece too yeah. today, because whether you, what, here's what we found out when we do the trainings, whether you work in a school setting or not, businesses have been targeted by attackers and churches have been targeted by attackers. I mean, you name it, it it's in the news and it becomes yeah. a threat and, and sometimes it becomes a fear. And I think fears are just so unhealthy yeah. that they can control us. And so by us talking about this a little bit, right. so my hope is we can share the response piece on what we do, how we prepare, how we, you know, the prevention pieces, yeah. and then we can get to what do you do in the event of when it's, when it's and, happening? And, and, and Jerry, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is about awareness. This isn't about paranoia. Um, like you said, it does happen in, in malls. Um, the, in Las Vegas, the, the concert venue, again, it, it's an aberration, um, and I hope it, you know, those things don't happen again. But I think the inevitable with our culture, with with gun-free zones, I think, and I'm not even going to go into that topic, right. but um, they happen everywhere. And I think we just need to be more aware while we're in public. It's sad that we have to talk about this, mm -hmm. um, but uh, prevention, I think, and awareness are going to be the two things that are really important. Yeah. And I know when you mentioned gun-free zone, I know <clears throat> politically kind of what you're shying away from, yeah. but w what he's saying, though, is targets – you know, the attackers are going to places where they know they're not going to get shots fired back at them. The least resistance least or resistance. no resistance. I mean, from their perspective, that's that's their planning and preparation on their side. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. A lot of people Absolutely. in one spot and they don't have firepower to return. Yeah. Yep. Um, real quickly, roll through. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we do for prevention. Mm -hmm. um, probably the number one thing we do for prevention, truthfully, and I think... Uh, one of the FBI reports talked about it was building relationships. Yep. I don't think people understand just how building positive relationships with people in a school or in yep. your workplace for sure creates safety. Yeah. Um, we, we, we're a school district that really builds, that's our, one of our foundations, is having positive relationships. We're small enough where we get to know the kids um, on, a, on a personal basis. You only have maybe anywhere from 8 to 18 kids in a classroom. Um, and you stand in the hallway and, and greet kids as they come in. And I think that's just the start of a positive relationship as they enter the classroom. That is kind of education 101. Um, but having good relationships with students and when you garner that relationship, that trust that is that is between you and that student 
which hopefully down the road, and we're going to talk about this leakers that, we t- that we're going to discuss here shortly. Um, so when something does, they, they don't feel, it, it doesn't feel right to them either um, on a social media platform or at the lunch table or walking down the hallway. They have somebody, not just a counselor, um, but somebody to come in and talk to you about leaking information. We'll talk about the leakers here, but I think number one, awareness is the key. Yeah, awareness, and uh, it kind of heads towards that leaker conversation, yes. but I don't think people understand that most of the time, and I'm talking from the office of a principal, most of the time when a, when we have concerns of a student with self-harm, I'll use that one as an example, Good. it doesn't come directly from that student. It comes from a friend. That's right. It comes from somebody else. It comes from a third party that yep. brings us that information. Yep. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to create with those relationships. Yep. I mean, kids, students, um, they're... They have eyes and ears mm-hmm. that that we don't have, and they don't want to come in and be a quote unquote tattler or squealer. But um, I, I think their best friend's safety yeah. or the school's safety in general, um, whether it's on some sort of social media platform like um, Instagram or Snapchat, um, when something is said, um, we need to make sure that they have that that relationship that they come in and, and aren't fearful of, of any sort of repercussions. But so they, if they share, man, that, that just, it's so much better. That's the do. first thing I think of when you said that teens have eyes and ears where we don't, I think of online. Yep. I think of the social media platforms, the yep. Snapchats. Those are things that no matter how badly we want to watch, um, you know, and monitor that. We just, we're not there. Yeah. We, we, we don't have access to it. And quite frankly, I really, I, I don't want to have that yeah. online relationship <laughs> right. with, with, a, with a student because I mean, yeah. there's, there's some, Absolutely. there's some things we just, we yes. don't need to know, but boy, school safety. But when you mention self-harm, that's, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that is, they always give indicators. There's always something said, there's always a comment or, um, we just need to be, have a good relationship for, for them to share with us. So we're trying to get the friend, the, you know, we need good relationships with yeah, the friends. For sure. Yep. For um, sure. As far as how we prepare, so that's a little bit about prevention. As far as how we prepare, we've, and we'll get into the, uh, more of the tactics of how we do lockdown drills. But one thing is we've added lockdown drills. And sometimes I get comments from the public like, well, we do fire drills every single month. Yeah. And when was the last time somebody was killed in a school from a fire? It was in the... 58, 50, 1958. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's how many trainings we've been yeah. to that you know that answer. <laughs> um, but that's an example where the training has worked. Yep. It works so that without even thinking, when the fire alarms go off, when there's a signal, there's a response and the entire building is evacuated in, in a minute. And, you know, and everybody knows what to do. Everyone knows where they're going. State policy, state law says every month at least one has to be done. And then the, tor- the evacuation drills that we have, the fire drills and the shelter drills or tornado drills, there's state policy that has been passed for that. And with all the crises that have happened over the last 20 years, you know, when are we going to have a formal... Yep rule policy for this so these things may not stop but man the the fatalities are are, are seriously reduced and in our state we we had a mandated once a year shelter drill which is for us it's tornado for other parts of the nation i I remember we were in a conference in alabama Alabama. at a school safety conference they were talking about their shelter drills they're talking about hurricanes yep. and tsunamis and I never thought of that yeah, you know right. for us it's tornadoes yep. other places you know on the west coast it's earthquakes yep. um and so one thing i was kind of impressed about is a couple of years ago in our state the state said no you're going to do two you're going to do at least once one each semester yep. there are no mandated lockdown drills not zero it's, and no one tells you how often you should do them right uh, or that you need to do them. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, just leave that one out there. And, and schools have made changes since then. You know, when, when uh, our court system, our justice system protects kids. I right. mean, they are advocates for the learning environment and for the safety and uh, of that learning environment. Man, the, the schools have put in all sorts of lights and whistles, and they made fire retardant material, and every classroom has to have a certain number of sprinkler systems and smoke detectors. Type of doors. Exactly, fire, fire uh, retardant doors. So again, when do we make that transition? How? What's it gonna take to make that, um, those sort of mandatory drills? Uh, I think enough is enough, and I think this, this sort of stuff, that, those sorts of things have to happen. Yeah, they talk about building codes and how the building 
building codes, you know, changed exactly. over the years. And so now if you build a new school, it has to meet these codes. And yep. so we're hoping at some point that school safety, yep. um, you know, as far as beyond that, like the school attackers, like our topic today, I'm not going to shout around the bush. Right. School attackers that we're going to have front door entrances that are better monitored yep. versus, you know, those of you alumni in this district, just think about our middle school. Yep. You know, the high school has been tricky enough and we've done some changes there, but the middle school, you don't even see. I mean, it's in the middle of a stairwell. Yep. Up or down, there's no way to monitor other than the little camera at the door. You know, that we, we put cameras in for, for certain reasons. It's not going to prevent necessarily. Right. It's going to record. It's going to keep track of. Um, but you have schools now that make an out, out, outside door or entrance, and then you have a secondary containment area. And you'd never think that would ever happen where you have to hold somebody like in a holding cell right. before they have access to the actual inside of the building. But again, like the 1958 deaths of some students for fire there's going to be some changes made right right i mean they already have but in cameras over and over at these trainings we just hear cameras are just for recording evidence for afterwards that's right that's so exactly they're, right they're, they're not so much the prevention they, for instance you ask any teacher or student in this building there's cameras in the halls at all of our schools by the way in this in this community nobody even remembers the cameras are there anymore right. You know, exactly. so I don't, so they're not doing a prevention. Yeah, they're evidence collecting. That's that's good. That's a good way to put it. You know, through these venues like this, Jerry, we're we're talking about communicating the plan and preparing. This is just one step. I'm hoping we do more of these. Right. I think this this is just a very we're scratching the surface of what we do here. But uh, the whole idea we have to plan and we have to make sure that we keep communicating the plan and then practicing the plan. Practice. Yeah. Practice the plan. I always wonder whether we're doing enough. And, you know, as an administrator, it's it's still, you know, it's just that balance. I, you know, we just keep pushing it. Our, I know our lockdown drills are in every building in this district. Yep. Um, and how we do them has changed in the last probably eight years. I'm glad you said that because I, I, I sometimes think we need to have a lockdown drill every other month at, yeah. at a minimum. Yeah. But, again, with all everything else that's happening, when, when you, you never want to do it at the same time with in the same class, um, but we have a lot of other things to do besides. We have to educate. Absolutely, but this yeah, is right. part of that as well. Right, but right. Um, so, I think on um, the last point I'd have on this. So we're talking about preparation and what we do for preparation. Um, I'm just going to note for the non-school people out there that. Um, the state has evolved since their safety plan came out where it used to be a school safety plan was just a crisis plan. Right. What do you do in the event of, you know, this, this, and this? Um, and one thing that I'm proud of across this state, Nebraska is really doing a good job of, of being in the front of taking yeah. school safety uh, seriously, Agreed. is those plans are not crisis plans anymore. The crisis plan is part of it, but they're safety plans. Yes. So they're much broader, like the parent. Um, student reunification is in there. Yep. For us, are the specific lockdown drill uh, and how we run that is in there. Yep. Um, there's some other things in there too, but it really broadens. It's not just for these specific crisis events like it used to be right. five, ten years ago. And then there's and then there's another part of that, and just to add it is the threat assessment. Now oh, we, we have we have students that may exhibit some of these behaviors. What's our threshold of tolerance for that? I mean, we keep it pretty low. So if there's just an, an indicator of maybe something said, yeah. we we try to stem that and try to try to take a, a preemptive strike on that, so to speak. And then we we go down through the path. Is it is it truly something that we need to to at least call a parent or? Is there a counselor involved? Are they receiving services? Uh, who do we talk to next? That's always the, the thing. If we have time when we get through this, I would really like some time to talk about threat uh, threat assessments because yeah. that's the new piece that we've we've added recently. It's new information you and I have just been handed. Yep. Thursday uh, well. last week. We've got some of that printed in front of us here. Yep. Um, the Secret Service came out with their newest. Um, it's phenomenal. Yeah, their, their guidelines, their executive summary is amazing. So yeah. hopefully we can talk about threat assessment because that's that's a piece that kind of comes into that prep, yeah. um, being prepared and the prevention piece as yes. well. Um, anyways, I kind of want to make sure we talk. With the, 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 the gist of this is probably going to be on response. Yeah. Uh, response. What do you do in the event? And we're going to talk about school attacker. Yeah. Okay. So, Craig, if we find out there's an attacker, what words do we use? What takes place? What do we do? Where does it start? What well, do we do? I mean, first thing we need to make sure that everybody understands is that um, there's not one single person that can make the call of a lockdown. It could be student. It could be our maintenance 
um, in, uh, personnel, uh, people that are in food services, mm-hmm. um, if they see something legit, mm-hmm. you know, they they have the call to make a lockdown, and that could be yelling. It could Absolutely. be um, a call to nine one one, but you have to you have to let the school know first because we you you're 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 a genius with the, the statistics, but there's only so many seconds and certainly minutes mm-hmm. um, before when this thing starts to when it ends. Um, and then we look at the, 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 the time of, of the response by whether it's law enforcement, um, and then first responders after that. But anybody can make a lockdown. That is the first key thing is you have to let as many people know from the get-go that there is a, a, a lockdown. There's, you can yell it's a gun or a shooter or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and that will indicate to people that are nearby initially to get to a lockdown. And so for for us, lockdown, we communicate that as the threat is in the building. Yep, exactly. Yeah, Because if the threat's outside, and by the way, there are threats outside. There could be a dog running around with rabies yep. or, you know, in these parts, you might have a mountain lion that's been spotted on campus. So we would do a lockout. Yep. A lockout means we're going to still teach. Yep. Business is normal inside the doors, but nobody's going out. Nobody comes in. We, yep. We're going to monitor the doors on a lockout. But for us, lockdown is our biggest signal yep. that there is a threat inside the building right and and it it doesn't have to come from the intercom system and it probably Uh, won't yeah they probably won't you'll hear it might even be the sound of of a of they always say firecrackers um could be a weapon that's being discharged um and you have got to the first thing we do uh, is doors go shut kids that are happen to be in the hallway um we've read the new the new study it could be in a passing period. It could be when everybody's gathering in the commons area and you have to get to a safe place. Avoid first. We have acronyms ADD, um, avoid, deny, and defend. We hope we never have to get to defend, but uh, the number one is avoid. Um, and to get to a safe place, that safe place could be to exit the building. If you're in a place that the 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 noise the action the violence is going on in one place and you're in the other part of the building you, you hear say all the time at least people have been in our trainings you're responsible for your own life and so if that means exiting the building by all means exit the building but avoid first avoid um so when we do the trainings a lot of times especially with with students but i mean staff as well avoid means two things for us if and i always tell tell uh, people in the training that avoid means if I know that there's firecrackers going off to my right, I run to my left. In other words, avoid gives you permission to run and run away that I know of as of now. And this data was good as of a year and a half ago when you and I was doing some trainings that there was not a K-12 fatality in the U S from anyone who was running. As long as they're moving, moving, you, you might, you might get injured. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we have seen studies of multiple. Christine Anderson was shot three times. Three times. Um, she had surgeries, but she she lived, yeah. and she's a survivor. Uh, the gentleman in Wisconsin who was shot, he was the police officer, was shot sixteen times, twice in the head. You can still be shot and still. And again, he was moving. She was she was moving. So zero um, percent. You know what I mean? Of, of deaths, as long as you're moving. So avoid, yeah. avoid, avoid. So, uh, you know, the way we train elementary students, if you're out on the playground, you know, and there's chaos going on, you're hearing everyone yelling, lockdown, lockdown. Avoid means run into the neighborhood. Yep. It don't, don't run back to the school. Right. So we're trying to train that muscle memory. Like when a fire alarm goes off, everyone gets up and starts heading out the yep. door and they follow yep. the same path yep. down the sidewalk, across yep. the street, et cetera. So we're trying to make sure that we communicate. Avoid is run away. Run right. away if you know which direction the threat is right. from. Run in the opposite direction. Yeah. But the second part is a little trickier on avoid is what if you right. don't know where the threat is? And so when we get to that one, when we talk about avoid, we talk about run into a securable room. Right. Running to some place that you can feel like you can secure yourself in. Exactly. And you might be sitting in that room at the time. Yeah. Or you could be in the hallway and you get to the nearest room, yep. um, but it's it's that second one is deny, and that means 
you know, we have magnetic strips on each one of our doors, and our doors are already locked. And so it's 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 a snap of the fingers. If somebody's near that door, it's 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 pull the magnet strip off the door jam and pull the door shut. And that's just the beginning of itself inside that classroom. Yeah. And then it becomes securing the door, yeah. and then it becomes barricading and just stacking if you have to. Um, being um, a, a little off the hook of of the thought process, you may have to use your belt. To, right, to lock right. down, uh, but it's it's that deny and whatever you can do to deny, uh, stack as many tables, push desks in front of it, and you're just trying to stop somebody from entering that room. I know how you feel about this, but I I believe deny and barricade is a skill. Yes. Do we practice those skills? Yes, and you have to you have to continuously practice those skills because those things will go away. It's no different than practicing free throws. It's no different than than going out with a bow and, and practicing your your form and follow through. Um, those that's a perishable skill that will go away if you don't practice if you don't practice that. So when we do what he's saying, when we do our lockdown drills, we our students practice it's, barricading doors. Um, in this district. Every door is locked all day long. Mm -hmm. We use the magnetic strips um, that we put over the latch plate yep. um, so that the door can open and close. But that way, any student can run into any room, pull the magnet strip, and that door is going to lock. But part of what we're training with students and staff, and hopefully they share with their loved ones and their families, is how to secure, how to create the deny piece. Right. If you don't have the keys, if you don't have a room that locks, what if you're in a college uh, classroom someday? Yeah. What if you're at a concert? What if you're wherever? Yeah. So we're trying to teach skills that go far beyond school. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to practice these skills of barricading. So for us, we barricade. So avoid, deny, and we'll get to defend here in a minute. But avoid, run away from the threat if you know where yeah. it's from, or run to a securable location. Because yeah. we would do these trainings. I remember every time we'd start, It'd be some staff member, some student, like, what if I'm in the bathroom? That's a legitimate question. Exactly. And so and we say avoid. Yeah. Do you feel like it's a securable room? If you could secure yourself and barricade in there, by all means, stay. And if you have to use your body to be the barricade, to wedge the door yeah. shut, that's what you do. Because there's not a lot of things, like in a bathroom, we get what ifs all the time. What if I'm in the gymnasium? What if I'm in the weight room or the locker room? You're going to have to be a little ingenious on what you're going to have to do. And, and again, but I would still say, if you can avoid and get out, go out the side door right. and leave. Run. And don't come back until, I mean, you know things are safe. And we'll talk about the 911 calls as well, but um, avoid first. But yep. So if you don't feel safe in the room you're at, avoid, run, yep. get to some other place that's safe. So that's that's our two tips on avoid, yep. away, away from the thread or to some place that you feel you can secure. And for us in our classrooms, if we're sitting in classrooms, we do have to remind students that might be the securable place. You're yeah. already sitting in the room that you can secure easiest. Yeah. So you don't physically have to run to another yeah. room or another location if you feel you're in a securable location. Yeah. Lock it down. Yeah. And, and we know that just by locking down, yeah. you don't stop. It, that is not the only thing you do. It's not a standalone strategy. You are doing other things while you're in that room. Right. And again, that could include barricading. Correct. So and, and just to add a little more on the barricade piece, so that's deny. So avoid, deny, defend. So with deny, um, it's time barriers. You always do a good job talking about this. You're just creating time barriers. That's there. right. Um, there's data from all these school shootings. And I think one time a, a, a gunman tried to shoot at um, – at the door locking mechanism or that door handle to get in a lock, they don't spend time. No. Like the f number one thing you can do is be behind a locked door. Yep. And, and they're trying to create as much violence and death and chaos in the shortest amount of time. Um, they're trying to beat the law enforcement um, officers, the, the, the first responders from getting there. Columbine, for example, was the game changer with exactly. that. They don't show up to a school and then barrack, you know, make a make a perimeter and then wait for special weapons and units to come in. If it's one police officer or two, they're trained now. Protocol has changed, and they are entering the building and they're trying to stop the threat as soon as possible. That's that's what they do. Yeah, there's no more staging outside waiting for the SWAT. Team. No, and they, you, they go to Target. You know, when you said Jerry to create barriers, barriers creates time and time is life. I mean, everyone, we, when we talk about this, the students, um, time is life. If you can create more time, you, you're, you're going to have a better chance of making it out there, uh, making it, um, out alive and unscathed. That's, that's going to be the big thing. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, so deny. I'm trying to think if there's anything we want to add there. So, you know, you mentioned Columbine. I'm just going to come out and say this. This is my new line that I kind of created somewhere. And I was just listening to a parent from Sandy Hook. Yeah. Columbine changed protocols for law enforcement, mm-hmm. but it didn't change schools. It didn't do enough to change schools. Right. Sandy Hook changed schools. Yeah. You know, that's uh, – I, I had the chance to visit with one of the moms um, – uh, had two children in Sandy Hook and both her kids survived, right. but they have all this trauma. And it's like the lessons we learned from Sandy Hook. And I mean, Sandy Hook changed the way schools drill, yeah. the, our safety plans, um, how we, you know, they just, it, Columbine in 99 changed the way law enforcement responds. Right. And I just feel like Sandy Hook in 2012 changed how schools respond. Yep. Would agree. Yeah. So barricading, um, the data we use a lot is from Virginia Tech. Yep. Was that 2007? 2007. Yep. Um, in Virginia Tech, the, the data is very obvious as far as which doors were barricaded um, versus which weren't. Yep. And a gunman would, I think he reentered three times. Three times. Yep, he did. Um, went through like 400 and some rounds that yep. in 14 minutes or whatever it was. Yep. He was in the building. Yep. Um, it, it, as far as casualties, fatalities versus... You know, those who lived, you know, it just it's night and day difference. Those rooms that were barricaded, um, I think in the um, the rooms that were barricaded, um, only two people were killed. Correct. They had like 26 or 29 people either injured or not harmed at all. Yep. And in the rooms that were, had no barricade at all, it just kept reentering. I think yep. they had 27 fatalities. Yes. It, 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 that that. That Virginia Tech is the the statistic it is the yep. is the basis for that to show you how important barricading yep. is. You have to barricade. You have to demonstrate it with your students. Yep. Every teacher needs to. And we still we still have some that don't because they're unsure. And that is yep. that is common. Yep. I mean, if you if you don't know how to do it, we've always offered. Yep. Hey, we'll come, come in, in and your room with you. You betcha. We'll we'll help you. Or during a planning block, if if uh, if teachers that are comfortable doing it, they'll do it for other people as well. And we've done it for other schools in the district. Um, so it's just, uh, th- th- these are, th- this is one of the trainings that you don't have to like keep it secret. Some teachers like to keep what they, you know, that what they do is secret because they think they're the, the guru. This is something everybody needs to know. And that's why we go around and do sure. it. And we don't, what do you guys charge? And it's like nothing. Yeah. It's, I think this, these are, these are skills that I think are, are super important. Yeah. So. Um, and, and by the way, the barricading piece gets to be kind of fun with students. Yeah. I mean, they, they will Google ideas and from yep. belts to, Using yep uh, to using chairs um, extension equipment. cords oh, extension cords is yep. probably the most popular way yep. to barricade. Yep. So ask your students if you if you have a Shattern High student uh, at home, you know, ask them about it, and they, and that's that's why we do the drills at least twice a year, and yep. we just allow. And I always tell staff, take your time with it. Don't don't end just because I say the drill is over. By all means, keep practicing. Use that day to practice barricading. Exactly. Barricading is a really good skill to work. And don't be afraid to talk about it. Yep. I mean, I think there we, we've heard um, administrators from across the state, certainly when we were down in Omaha, they had said, well, we don't really like to talk about this because, well, one, we don't think it's going to happen in our school. And two, I just don't think this is something I feel comfortable talking about. And then our response usually is, well, then bring somebody in who is comfortable talking about it. Talk to your school board. Talk to your administrative team. I mean, these are things that we're not just teaching this for Shadron High right, students right, right. from kindergarten to 12th grade. They're all going to go off to whether it's a higher education to a college. And colleges are getting much better at doing this, but college campuses provide a whole different animal for this right. as well. Um, but whether they're, they're going to go to a, some sort of a, a church um, or an open venue, nearly everybody goes to a mall. These are all things that uh, skills and understandings that need to be carried over into that, that part of their life too. Right. So we talked about avoid. We talked about deny. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the, the last one, which is defend. It, you, when we talk about this, we are not teaching ninja skills. <laughs> We're not teaching anything like that. Um, it's just common sense. Um, when, when we talk about uh, this last piece, we give everybody the permission to live and however you have to do that. And if it's a void, there's going to be in the end when everything, the smoke clears, so to speak. Um, why, why did I live? There's going to be some of that guilt, that survivor guilt. Um, but you have to do whatever you have to do to live. 
And if that means you're going to use a, a paperweight or a, a um, stapler or whatever you have to do to defend yourself. And again, it's not you're going to go do this by yourself. We're hoping that it's going to be a group of four, five, ten people yeah. that if, if this is the last ditch, this is the thing you do because there's no other option. That person has breached the room and this is the last stand, so to speak. And you're going to have to defend yourself and the other people in the room. And over and over, you're, we're not going to be victims. Right. Sometimes I tell kids, you know, we're, it's hard for me not to swear when I say this, but we're from Western Nebraska. We're not going to be victims. Right. You know, just to empower and, and you know, That's you have my word. permission. Yeah. Um, age appropriate does come into play on this topic. Very now, you and I are sitting here talking because we work in a high school, yeah. but the way they do this in the elementaries and with kindergartners, et cetera, they, they call it throw and go. So they're just trying to create distractions. Correct. So the, the biggest tip on deny is don't think fighting. Right. Think distraction. Yeah. It's just creating a distraction so that you can run. Improvise. Yeah. Um, you, you need to be aggressive and you, you need to be all in because there's yeah. no just yeah. sort of this. There's, there's, a, there's a weapon that's being used that is very lethal, and you're going to have to respond to that with that same similar um, force. We, we call it find objects of opportunity. Yeah. Right and throw yep. them hard yep. right at shooter yep. um one of the trainings we did we actually got to we've been done at least three or more sim simulation yep. shooting simulations yeah, totally. yeah. and what we find is it's hard to shoot a firearm accurately mm -hmm. when your brain wants to you know block yep. and so you're, you're literally just we're just teaching kids yep. students and staff throw objects and run past them yep. run through the doorway throw yep. something first yeah um age appropriate maybe an adult could do a little more than throw maybe we could you know take a student desk and club right. the heck out of it. right um so we don't want to go into a lot of detail yeah. there but I, we just need to let you know that we don't say fight uh, no. we say defend you know and, and we've heard it over and over there there's nothing when you say the word defend it's empowering yes. a kindergarten teacher defending her kids or yep. his kids yep i mean that's there's nothing more aggressive than that. That's right. So That's right. it's not it's not fighting. It's not fighting skills. Right. We're, not, we're never going to teach that stuff. Uh, so it's a lot of throw and go and get the heck out of there. We talk about breaking windows, and yep. we have all kinds of stuff in place that we don't have time on today's podcast to talk about. But. And, and I think with this, too, is, is creating distance. If you can create yep. distance um, from that attacker, um, your your likelihood of, of surviving just goes up exponentially. So you're creating distance and a distraction to just to get yourself out of that situation. So yeah. that's part of that as well. Talk about loud noises and how sometimes that creates a distraction. Yep. It just... Those little things that, you know, OODA loop is kind of what we, we yeah. teach, which, in other words, a way to distract the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sandy Hook was an example. I think there was nine, nine little kids, six-year-olds, yeah. ran right past the shooter right out the door, and they're the only ones that survived in the classroom. Literally brushed as a six-year-old boy who grabbed two of his classmates and right. literally, literally brushed right up against um, that attacker and ran right by him and just kept running. He just yeah. grabbed hands and, and, and ran, so... Yep. That's certainly a hero there. Create a distraction and run. Yep. You know, run past them, run whatever. Yep. Um, again, for us, the, the balance is constantly age appropriate. I'll be honest with you, the, you, you get to teach primarily seniors. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of turn you loose with the seniors and mm -hmm. you can type you know talk about as an adult here's yep. some things you could do yep. completely different what we yep. would do with freshmen right exactly let alone if we're talking third graders or kindergartners yep. or first graders and i think those uh, those educators at that level too also have a better understanding what they're they're yep. going to do their their situation is totally different they could be outside also in, in a recess which we don't have that or or we have pe outside but boy things are just all different in that in their realm mm -hmm. um but sure and we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but, you know, the history, I always like to talk about the yep. history of, yep. of um, some of our listeners out there are going to know this is true. During the Cold War is where lockdowns, they think, actually started. Yep. And people would get underneath desks at the thought of nuclear war. <laughs> You know, like those, those are some magic desks yeah. back in those days. But that's, the, you know, the, I think what I've been able to find is that's kind of when that started, is laying on a floor, crawling under yep. a desk. That stuff started kind of Cold War era. Yeah, late 50s. And then in the mid-80s, a school district in uh, Los Angeles yep. was having an issue with drive-by shooting yep. with gang violence. Yep. And so they called it, they used the word lockdown. Yeah. And so when they had a lockdown, kids would lay on the floor yep. or huddle in a corner yep. where bullets couldn't fly through windows and get at them because the threat was outside the building. Yep. 
and bullets were coming inside the building. They'd get under tables and desks because bullets would hit lights and pieces of the ceiling would shatter down on them, and yep. so they would they would be underneath desks. And it makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, when, when the threat is outside, it's kind of similar to our lockouts. You, you keep that, that, that danger on the outside of the school. We secure the perimeter and keep the danger on the outside. And that just carried over into the 80s and 90s, 90s yeah. and where yeah. everybody huddled. Like, I can remember early in my, my career, that was when something happens, you go in the, in, the, in the corner of the classroom, turn the lights off, and just be quiet. And that is so against yeah. any, any common sense. But, man, up until about even 10 years ago, that was still... That was still the protocol, and that is so against um, common knowledge and, and just logic. So uh, as far as the publications that we could find, national publications, U.S. Department of Education in one of their guidelines in 2007 talked about a school shooting, but they didn't give any guidelines on how to respond to it. Right. It wasn't until 2013, and they used the words run, hide, fight, that, yep. and basically it just said in that publication, that's 2013. Right. They start. We were already doing our drills differently. Yep. Yep. Um, but that's when they finally got brave enough, Department of Ed, the FBI, Secret Service, all these different entities went together on this publication and said, it, you, we need more options. Yep. Uh, we need to be able to allow people to make their own decisions, whether that's students and staff, on survival. Right. And so that's when some of this, well, we were kind of ahead of the game mm -hmm. then. And then we, you know, one of the new ones we kind of twisted in there was reunification we could see where that was going to be an issue and we kind of got ahead of the curve on reunification plans as well and you know i think people need to understand reunification is after we exit the building or after a lockdown um some people have exited it's a crime scene where do we go to meet where do we go to make sure everybody is okay do evaluations for the medical side and then reunify those students with their parents and do it in an orderly manner um yeah. sy systemic manner so we're not it's just not mass chaos um and, and we've I, I think we've done uh, we have a, a nice location to do that um it's relatively close to the to our campuses and uh our law enforcement local law enforcement has has been very helpful in what they're going to do and assist us with that reunification. So again, I think we're ahead of the game, but I we have not practiced that yet. No. Um, and I we've walked through it. We've taken some staff and looked yep. at the sites. So we have a few sites in this community that we have a primary site, but we have some other sites. Um, and again, I don't want to kind of give that information out right, right now because we don't want parents beating us to the site. Right. Um, I'll just I'll just come out and say this. And parents, I don't mean to upset you when I say this, but. <laughs> If we have to do mass re um, evacuation from a building, let's just say that there was some little fire and it created smoke in the building. Gas we're gonna leak. Some gas. Yeah. We're going to have to evacuate the entire building. Yeah. So we're going to bust those kids to an off-site location. Our plans are set up so that parents never get out of a car. Yeah. We don't want parents coming Correct. in and bogging us down. We're yep. busy. We're still supervising kids. Yeah. So we have a plan in place for all of our buildings to be able to do student pickup you yep. uh, it's kind of like a drive a drive through you're going to pull up to one location fill out a card on who you're requesting you're going to pull ahead to the receive gate and we're going to bring your kid we're going to walk him yep. to you yep what staff member will walk your student to your car yep. and just keep keep the line moving and just I, keep yeah I, you know anytime there's we talked about this and example after example at, when a, a major event happens Everybody rushes to the yeah. school um, and wants to find out what's going on because of the our devices, our phones. We have students that are communicating, and we do encourage that. We encourage the communication Absolutely. via texting, yeah. not a call. Why texting? Uh, Let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, texting is a, a single line being used. Okay. It's an SMS, and it's being a single line is sent to the tower and then to the receiving device. A call sends two to the tower and then two to the to the receiving device. It bogs everything down. Every single major event has crashed cell phone towers. In how long? In less than ten minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it is it's a hassle because I think we need to have those community. Even though the, the law enforcement, and first responders, medical personnel are going to be using uh, radios, there still needs to be communication there yeah. um, uh, via via yeah. uh, telephone or cell phone, and so they're going to inevitably crash. And we need to have and we encourage students. By all means, text your parents, tell them that you are okay, and you'll 
be constantly communicating with them, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes, I would say five because parents are going to be very protective um, of their of their uh, children. Uh, but there, there needs to be communication. And we, we talk with our students about calling 911. Who's to call 911? If we're in my room, one person is designated as calling 911 providing useful information um, to the dispatch so that they can convey that information to responding officers. Um, you, we, we always tell the, the students, don't give out information, don't be guessing on things you don't know. Because if, if, let's say, there is only one shooter, one killer, and you're saying there's lots of shots, I don't know how many people are out there, it sounds like two or three, yeah. well, you're giving misinformation yeah. to those, those responding law enforcement officers, and then they may be potentially looking yeah. for... Slowing down the response. Exactly, exactly. So, in fact, that's one of the key takeaways, I think, um, in today's conversation is um, in these mass media events cell towers are going to crash yep. um, texting texting every five minutes you yep. to your child yep. set set up a time they text i'm are you safe and the response i'm i'm safe yep. don't no long con you know no long conversation trying you're trying to push small text through yep. to get communication back and forth to your yep. to your student when you are barricaded in a room you you may be there 10 minutes oh, you I, could be there hours, three and a half hours absolutely and so it's going to be there's going to be lots of of uneasiness and anxiety that comes because of that but everybody at least when when we're in, in my room we go over this a lot with each of my my classes somebody's going to be in charge of calling 911 if we have to to let them in, and give information but everybody has a job during that lockdown so traffic thinking and, yeah traffic first responders trying to get to scene has been difficult yep. when it gets you know Yep. You just kind of a lot of parents trying to get to the scene. Yep. You know, I get it. I'm a parent too. You know, you're yep. a parent. Yep. You, we want to know how our kids, and that's you why betcha. you know we're going to try to do everything we can to communicate it's, out. It's natural the state that you know where we're at and, yep. and what we can. So it's natural. We've gone long today. We did not get to threat assessment. <laughs> I think you know I'm going to have to bring you back see if we can if you agree I'd, to do that. So I'd love can, to do that. That's the newest thing. So we we actually have a district team that has gone to a couple of different level one, level two threat assessment trainings. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something we need to continue to do. Yep. Um, this new information that we just we have in front of us right now, um, we need to we need to communicate that to the rest yep. of our team members too. So and, and you know the like uh, the I love you guys program. Yep. I think that is crucial. It's free. Um, all the all the, the the posters we we post in classrooms and in hallways they encourage they encourage schools to do it and be part of it. You don't have to pay anything. Um, it is simple verbiage. Is simple communication, um, and they have all sorts of, of backup plans for you if you want additional training. Um, so I'm I'm a big promoter of the I Love You Guys program, and they're on online. And um, I would encourage anybody who wants additional information to certainly go yep. there as well. I Love You Guys dot org. That's I the letter I Love You Guys dot org. Yep. Um, a lot of free material. That's where we built some of our plans on on what they provide, and they encourage it. Yeah, yeah, and they're just pushing this out. Free resources. It's there's a reason behind that. They yep. they lost a daughter, and instead of being so happy and litigious, um, there was no lawsuit. They're 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 very different than anybody else, and they wanted to make sure that these programs. What can we do to to at least uh, diminish or or uh, stop this from ever happening again? Yeah, it's it's good stuff. So just to recap before we close, we talked a little bit about prevention and that's building relationships with trust so that you can get the leakers to come to you you can get the exactly. friend of the friend of the person yeah um you know because most of the time the attacker has communicated um the plan yep and so you're trying to get that person on multiple venues yes typically yes and so you're trying to get those people to come report yeah uh, so that's a key piece it's not the only thing but that's a key piece of prevention yeah. Yeah. preparedness is to have plans and practice those plans you know do drills um, would be a key piece there. Response, we talked about avoid, deny, defend. Yeah. We went into each of those three. Um, and then finally, recovery. And, and recovery recovery begins as soon as the incident's over. Yeah. When bad guy is taken down, you're in recovery mode. And, yeah. and so we have some plans in place on what we're going to do, yeah. including the, uh, the student parent reunification and how we will do donations. But uh, so recovery is is the the fourth part of that, and I think the the psychological help, the the the, the debriefings um, by our mental yeah. health providers is is also going to be key, and that could be that's going to be months and probably years, years or something. Yeah, for I think most so. people. Yeah, uh, Craig, thanks for your time today. That's you're more than welcome. If you have any, you know, 
I love you guys. Dot org is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, take a look at Department of Education has their stuff posted that we use for school safety. We're resources for you too. So if you have questions, let us know. Thanks for your time today on, on today's Cardinal Cast. Um, we'll be seeing you next week. I don't know the topic next week, so we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. All right, have a good week.